Hey everybody, this is Jim Nee from Jim Nee Woodworks. Uh, today I'm going to do this a video on building this walnut mantle. Um, I made it for a, a couple friends who are making a custom home. Um, so I'm going to cover some techniques and tips um, that I haven't seen covered too well in other videos and I'm going to skip a lot of the stuff like you know milling lumber and glue ups and using a biscuit jointer and just stuff like that, that that are used in this that you know other people have done great videos on so there's no need to for me to cover it but I'm gonna try to stick to some of the things that I thought were um, maybe a little less covered in other, in other videos so far so there's a little bit of CNC carving in here um, some sanding, uh, how I did the finishing, how I built the template to um, fit this on here and install. So hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you do, please uh, think about subscribing to my channel. It helps me out. And please add comments or questions. I read them all and respond to all questions. And I also appreciate any feedback on future content or videos that I could do that would be um, of value to people. Thank you. So this is the fireplace that we're going to put the mantle on. You can see the 2x4 along the top edge. Uh, it's kind of a white color in the middle there. That's That was screwed to the wall. And, and that's what we're going to mount the uh, fireplace, or the, the sorry, the mantle too. It's going to screw down on the edges. Kind of the back of the um, mantle will wrap around that 2x4. I kind of I screwed up the video on us making the template for this. So I'm just going to talk through the next couple of still pictures as to how we generated a template to create the shape of the mantle so that it fits the wall and fireplace nicely. Okay, this is a close up of the area around the uh, mounting area for the mantle. And you can see the two by four. Um, basically, the fireplace is you know built out its stick frame and then they put a like a concrete backer board over it um, and then what we did was bolted the two by four over the top of that um, where where the mantle was to go and then they took a um, three-quarter inch strips of MDF or, or plywood or something and just tacked it on above and below the two by four to provide a, a fixed gap um, so that the stone uh, masons when they put that on didn't get too close to the two by four because we want to be able to fit a uh, fit that profile above and below the two by four uh, of the walnut part of the mantle to be able to screw in there um, so those strips were put in place and then tacked on and then they put the stone in place butted up against those strips and then later those strips were moved to uh, create these gaps that are here. Um, so that's kind of the, the mounting system that we're using for this. Okay, this is the template laying on the floor in front of the fireplace. Um, and as I mentioned, I messed up the video showing how we made this. But basically, we start with some strips of cardboard that are the same width as the top shelf of the mantle is going to be. And then I just started in the left corner and made a piece and uh, laid it into the uh, above the 2x4 up against the wall because I want it to go into that kind of top slot tight against the wall. So I laid it in there and then scribed the left edge against the wall and then cut it out until I get a nice fit uh, tight up against the wall. And so that's my left edge. And then I simply uh, lay that in place and tape the long uh, front piece um, overlapping the side piece there so you can you can see the blue tape holding those two together and then I repeat the on the right side with the short piece scribing and cutting the right side until it fits the wall um, because this is a wrap around those two ends have to butt up against the wall and those are out outside exposed so we want those to fit really nicely uh, up against the wall and then I tape that short piece to the long piece. So that creates uh, a nice uh, fit all the way along the wall there. And then 
I simply just cut those front corners off so that we have a nice uh, flat surface all the way around. Now that'll tell me um, what my ends need to look like as well as give me a guide to cut the angles uh, where I have to miter the side to the middle uh, on each side. And this generally works pretty well. Um, you know, make sure you, when you do this, you have a stiff enough piece of cardboard and you tape them or staple them together or something really well so that they can't slide on you when you get them back to the shop or something. But other than that, other than that this method is pretty uh, foolproof. The customer made me this nice mock-up of what he wanted the shape of the uh, mantle to be. This back part here is the part that fits over the 2x4 uh, for support that's screwed to the wall. So we'll screw down in through this into that 2x4 to support it. And then this is the overhang lip and, and the overhang underneath. And we'll put some peg holes down here to hang stockings from and stuff. But this is, this is a good uh, cross section. It really helps me out uh, when somebody figures this out ahead of time then I don't really have to do much thinking I can just simply measure off of this and and build the uh, whole thing from that this is a time lapse of the roughing pass on the CNC so a roughing pass is just a way to use a larger bit and take a lot more material off uh, to save time um, so I'm using a quarter inch ball nose bit in this case and I think it did four depth passes here um, and so this part I think took 45 minutes to an hour or something um, and we're taking um, all the material down to about 40 thousandths of an inch to the actual model um, outline so the remaining bit that's a fine detail bit uh, typically doesn't have to take off more than about 40 or 50 thousandths of an inch so this part runs pretty quick Now this is the fine detail pass after the roughing pass is done. So with the roughing pass, you can kind of get a rough idea of what the the object is, or you know the shapes and things. You can kind of you can't see it here very well, maybe, but up close you can tell. You know it's trees and mountains and stuff like that. But the detail isn't there yet because that was done with the large bit. So now we use a the fine pass, and this is a one millimeter tapered ball nose. So it's a long skinny bit uh, two flute carbide bit and it's going back and forth and stepping over about eight thousandths of an inch at a time so this takes a long time um, it's in this case there's a lot of very detailed trees and so there's some very steep uh, up and down movement so it's kind of slow um, this run I believe is around seven to eight hours to complete this so I have it running in very fast time-lapse okay this is the carving right after I took it out of the CNC machine I think you could kind of see in the um, picture here there's a lot of fuzz left over that tiny little it's a I use a, a one millimeter tapered ball nose bit. Um, I'll blow it off here a little bit. And you can see there's a lot of these little fuzzy pieces left over uh, from that bit. They rub off pretty easily. Um, you can see on the smooth part here it rubs right off. It's hard to get down in these little cracks to get this off and normally you'd be sitting there for a long time trying to pick those out with sandpaper or something um, but what I like to use that works really good for these is um, these little nylon abrasive wheels you just put them in a drill um, and you know they they get right down in those cracks and they rub those things out and these this set I got for like 20 bucks or 30 bucks on Amazon uh, you can see it comes in all a range of grits from uh, I think like 80 grit here all the way up to 400 I believe something like that um, so you can go all the way uh, from you know a really rough sanding of this to a really kind of almost burnishing it or polishing it um, 
So these work really well. Uh, they don't uh, take out the detail of the carving, but they get that um, fuzz out of there and really clean this up now. So I'm going to run that through here to show you how clean that works. Now what I do is when I put these on the drill, you'll see I kind of work them in all different directions. As you can kind of imagine, like in this area, uh, I want the bristles oriented this way so that they can spin up through these like tree branches here. And then what I'll do is I'll reverse the drill and go the other way too. So I try to work all directions. And then in some of the areas, like down here, uh, instead of going this way, I want to go this way. And, you know, I kind of work all four directions with the drill as I'm working. Uh, and that, you know, that gets those bristles down in the, into the cracks and, and rubs those things out and sands it. Now, the one thing you have to worry about, the, these are nylon bristles with a little bit of abrasive added to it. So if you push too hard and you run the drill too fast, it can melt the nylon a little bit and you'll end up with that nylon, that blue colored nylon melting to your wood, which obviously you don't want. So you kind of have to take your time with this. Um, like I said, it works really well, but you know, you don't want to run the drill too fast. You don't want to push too hard. I just use a, a simple rechargeable drill that works the best uh, and it's plenty fast. So um, I'll kind of run this through time lapse so you can see how that works now. So you can see here I'm working the nylon brush with the drill in all four directions. So X and Y to the left, to the right, um, up and down, and that gets uh, the bristles coming in from all directions and that does the best job. Uh, you got to look out to make sure you don't um, hit the workpiece with the chuck of the drill. You can put some scratches and dents in your workpiece uh, if you're not too careful there. Okay, now you can see this is uh, all the fuzz is removed. There's still some, this particular carving has some super deep holes uh, down in it for the, the 3D of these trees. So uh, I'm going to have to get... Uh, in there with the finer grit yet. Um, I started with like a 240 grit and you can see I ran it real slow in some cases. It works better. Um, I'm not really trying to sand this down. I'm just trying to kind of burnish and polish the surface and get those little fuzzy pieces off. So I actually put the drill on low speed and push pretty hard to try to get the little nylon bristles down in those cracks to rub those pieces off. And I find that if you run it really fast, they just kind of skim over the surface and they don't get down there and really scrub it. So I've got a little work to do. You can see some uh, down in here yet at the bottom. But in general, like the, the, the flatter profiles here, these mountains in the background, uh, clean up very quickly. And most of these trees here uh, came clean as well. So a little bit more work. But that's the general idea is kind of rub them in all four directions, trying to get down in those cracks and take your time just... Uh, push hard and then run it slow to get down into those holes and it'll clean it up really nice for you. That's about the fastest way I've seen of, of doing this. Um, um, and those bristles are, the kits are pretty cheap on the internet. So uh, I just got mine off of Amazon. Okay, this is what it looks like now after uh, hand sanding um, to blend these edges in. There was a, it always leaves a little bit of a, of a, ridge around the edge so I, I sanded that out. I still have a few of, on, on the steeper horizontal pieces here. The This is the direction that the rastering was going with the CNC and there's still a few grooves in here I need to sand out but other than that this all looks pretty good. Almost uh, all those little fuzzy pieces are gone. Um, there's a few down deep in the holes but I'm going to finish this and then and then pop those out after the first coat of finish. It, it helps break them off easier. Um, but anyway, that's the that's the whole front part of the mantle now. So I can assemble this into uh, the rest um, and make the make the whole mantle. Okay, on the inside of this lip, I want to have some holes to put these little cribbage pegs that I bought on Amazon. They're pretty cheap. Um, to hang things like stockings over the fireplace or Christmas tree lights or something so they'll be removable. So over here I've set up the board at an angle like this so that it'll give a slight um, angle up um, on these pegs so they don't fall out easily. And I just set a row of pocket cuts out on my CNC here so I can cut nice uh, holes to the diameter I need 
every inch and I'm going to do that all the way along both sides in the front. I didn't take any video of actually constructing the mantle box, but as you can kind of see from this, this, this bottom walnut piece that's laying in the bottom of this uh, clamped together mass, that's the, the actual top. And then the walnut piece in the background with all those little holes, that's the front edge or front board um, of the mantle. So this whole assembly is upside down. And you can see what I did was I built a kind of a honeycomb or box out of uh, three quarter inch plywood and glued it into the center of this. And so it kind of makes it all rigid, um, but it also allows me to glue all of these pieces of walnut together and make a nice square box and everything. Um, and gives that gives me surfaces to glue the top and the bottom to. So uh, basically I glued the front edge walnut to the top walnut and then glued this box in here and you can see it takes a lot of clamps to do that and then I made the two short pieces on each end the same way and these are all over length and so once the whole thing is made I'm going to miter them using the a large bandsaw and the table saw um, so after this picture was taken the only remaining piece to glue on was the bottom of the mantle which is the top of this picture this is the glue up uh, method I use to join one of the sides to the long center piece now I didn't show any pictures of it but um, I I got the angle that was needed for these from the template or at least the starting angle um, the Side, two side pieces were short enough and small enough that I could handle them on the bandsaw. So when I marked those um, and used a miter gauge on my 24 inch bandsaw to cut those. However, the center piece was about eight feet long and probably weighed 60 or 70 pounds. It was pretty hard to manhandle into any tool. So I have a large sliding cutoff table um, on my table saw. So I had to cut this on the table saw. Um, which was difficult because my table saw can only cut about halfway through. This is about five inches tall. So I had to actually cut from both sides and get the angle to match because it's the opposite direction when you flip it over. So this was a little tricky. So, so I kind of had a process of cutting them all, um, making sure the angle was right versus the template. So I butted them together and put the cardboard template on the top and then adjusted the angle and then to get the gaps closed all the way around I used a hand plane um, to make small adjustments so that the top board the front board and the bottom board all came together nicely um, and made a nice joint so once that was done then I just simply used biscuits uh, a couple on the top and the bottom boards and one in the front um, to, to hold these together and then this here uh, picture is showing how I glued those up. So I need to pull those two pieces together. And since this is at a 45 degree angle, what I did was uh, used clamps to uh, clamps to hold clamps essentially. So I put clamps in the two in the back and two in the front that were on each piece that I was gluing together. And then I used these horizontal clamps to draw the clamps together, which pulls the wood together tight. Um, in this case, they were a little too slippery. I got enough clamping pressure for this, but if I would have needed more, I couldn't really get more. Uh, in some cases, it helps to put like a sanding mat or some sandpaper or something between the clamp and the wood on the ones that are that that you're the clamps that you're using to make a surface to grab the wood with. So if they start sliding on you, you can put some something a little stickier in there to to hold them, and you'll get a little more clamping pressure. Uh, but this worked very well. And this is just a picture of the same clamping setup from the back side. So I did use the same thing uh, on the front and the back at the same time. And then I could get even pressure 
um, on the front and the back as well as the top and the bottom. Okay, I have the mantle all done from an assembly perspective. Uh, it's sanded to 400 grit with the grain, so it's pretty smooth. So now I'm gonna put the first coat on a finish, and my favorite product that I use just about for everything is Minwax uh, polyurethane. I've tried a lot of other finishes and methods of applying it in the last 35 years, and I always come back to this because it's uh, just really easy to, to use and I get a good finish out of it. So I use a combination of the spray uh, version and the wipe-on version. They also make a thicker uh, brush-on version. So if I'm doing a tabletop that I want super thick layers and really protective uh, and no wood grain touch or feel to it, I'll use that. But typically for something like uh, walnut, I want to see the grain a little bit um, and I don't need, you know, I don't need waterproof protection on this for days or anything. So um, I'm going to use about two coats of the wipe on. That really lets it soak in to the wood uh, and fill all the pores, especially in something like walnut or oak where it has very deep pores. I want that really to soak in. And then I'm going to come back and finish it with two to three spray on coats. That gives me you know, zero uh, brush marks or wipe marks. I get a nice smooth finish. Um, I can put it on actually pretty a lot thicker with this because I can spray it on, let wait for 30 seconds till it gets tacky and put another one on. Um, and this stuff dries pretty good. Here in Arizona it's really dry anyway so I can put three coats of this on in a day easily. Um, and then I'm going to sand in between uh, either 400 or 600 grit depending on um, how, depending on what the piece is. Um, in this case probably 400. Um, so I'm going to start with the wipe on here. I'm just using a chunk of t-shirt. Um, uh, I find that works as good as anything. Uh, you don't have to be too careful about dust or anything with this finish because you're just going to sand it in between. So any dust or little pieces of lint that get in this, I'm just going to sand that off anyway on the next coat. So it really doesn't matter. The very last coat that I spray on, I'll be a little careful. If it's windy outside, I'll close all my doors and stuff. But other than that, uh, it's it's not too fussy. This stuff dries, skins over in probably five to ten minutes uh, in low humidity like here in Arizona. So there isn't much, and once it's skinned over, it's not going to have dust and stuff sticking to it. Um, the biggest problem I have is bugs, so uh, I don't put the last coat on at night with the lights because it attracts bugs and they'll come down and sit in it. So um, I, I do my last coat during the daylight hours. So. Um, I'll, I'll show you how easy this is to put on now. I didn't mention it, but this is clear satin. Um, they also make a semi-gloss and a gloss finish. Um, I personally don't like a gloss finish on wood. Uh, it shows every little defect and I just, I don't like the looks of it. So I generally, um, use satin. Sometimes if somebody really wants that shiny, I'll use a semi-gloss, but um, I usually use the satin. And one thing to note about the satin, the, the way they get it to be satin is they put tiny little particles in it to uh, kind of make the surface uh, not so shiny. It's, it leaves it just slightly bumpy. You can't feel it, but it actually affects the sheen. So you want the it's not as important with the gloss, but with the semi-gloss, you want to kind of shake the can a little bit um, obviously, if you're doing spray paint, you need to shake the can very well anyway to mix it up with the aerosol. But even the wipe on, you want to shake it a little bit and get all those little particles stirred up so that you get a consistent level or sheen. Um, otherwise, you could, from coat to coat, you can actually get a little bit of difference that you might notice in the water. So I'll shake it up a little bit. And then um, I'm just going to wipe it on. I'll just dump a little bit on here like this. and. Um, just wipe it on a little piece of stuff there and it's really just that simple um, I'm gonna wipe it on I, I really put it on heavy especially in this first coat I want to soak it in in all the cracks and get it get it soaked in as deep as I can this first time because on the next sets of coats it's um, 
going to have a harder time getting through this first coat. So, uh, you know, I have less, it's, there's less chance that it's really going to soak in very far on the second and, and on coat. Um, so this first one I put on super heavy. If it runs a little bit, um, I'll wipe it off. But if there's runs and stuff uh, that are here that dry in later and I don't notice, it's not, like I said, no big deal. Uh, if it's a really big one, I'll use a real sharp chisel and just slice off the top of it and then sand it. But otherwise, it almost always sands out. Um, so that's all there is to it. Now the you can you can almost I don't know if you can see in the camera, but like this area has already started to kind of dry up. So I'll actually kind of just go over it a few times to really push a lot in there. Um, and now this is kind of a detailed carving. It's hard to get the finish in there and not end up with like puddles down in there. So one trick I've learned is I'll put a whole bunch in here, just slobber it in here really good. Um, Cause I want to, again, I want to get everything worked into this and soaked in as good as I can. And then when I got it all in there and I put a couple coats in and it's soaking, now I'm going to have a few puddles down in there and I don't want those puddles. So what I'll do is come back and just lightly blow on this. To get those puddles out, it kind of spreads it out. You got to be a little careful because it kind of splashes out and it might get on your tools and stuff. But if you just gently blow this like that, it'll spread it out and uh, get rid of those puddles. And again, it doesn't have to be a perfect finish because I'm going to buff this and, and sand. I'm going to sand the flat areas and I'm going to buff the carvings with the same um, sanding brushes that I use to uh, get the fuzzies out. But I'm going to use a, a higher grit. So um, again, I just want to get rid of the places where there's a whole big puddle settled um, and get a nice coat in here. So this, this has worked really good for me on these detailed carvings, right? Um, or any kind of machining where you have deep grooves and the finish tends to finish and uh, sink in there. And then later when I'm doing the spray coats, I don't have to worry about it because as long as I'm careful and don't spray too heavy, it coats everything very nicely. So that's all there is. I'm just going to keep on. And you can see the spots showed up here from spraying this. So I'll just go back over those. So the rest is kind of boring to watch. I'm just going to finish the rest of it. Another thing to note when you're wiping on, it's nice to have the surface horizontal so you can pour it on. So I've tipped it down here to do the, the top portion of the mantle. And something I didn't mention was that wood expands and contracts with moisture very heavily. So um, a lot of people have a tendency just to finish the part of the project that they can see, you know, like the top of a table, but they'll leave the underside with no finish on it. And that's not a good idea. Uh, you want the moisture to be absorbed on both sides of the wood at the same rate over its life. If you just finish the top, that slows down the rate that the, the moisture can enter and leave the wood uh, versus the other side. And what happens is that side, for example, if the top expands because it absorbs wood, it's like a bimetallic strip of metal for a thermostat. It's going to cause this to warp. Um, so that'll expand and it'll, it'll make a bow like this. And then when it dries out, it'll do the opposite. So the the smartest thing to do is to finish this all the way around so I finish all of my projects as much as I can in this case I can't get to the insides because this has actually got a kind of a honeycomb plywood box on the inside as a frame to hold it together but I'm going to finish the back side of this I'm going to finish the end grain um, anything I can put finish on um, obviously those back sides don't have to be pretty because nobody's going to see them. This is the wall side and some of this is going to be underneath stone on the on the fireplace. But I'm still going to put finish on it because I want all, all of this to kind of have an even balance when it when it's exposed to moisture. And you should, like I said, you should definitely especially do that with large tabletops, um, furniture like dressers and stuff because um, 
that really helps them over their lifetime stay you know flat and stable and not have cracks and things like that. Also, I want to rub this down into these screw holes that are going to mount this to the wall. And just, I just keep working it in again. The first coat is the important one to really put a, a lot on because this, this is really the only one that's going to soak into the wood at all. And it doesn't soak in super deep. When you do a, if you cut, come back after putting a finish on this and cross cut it, for most woods, you'll see that it actually hasn't gone in that far, but it does go in far enough, especially, probably more importantly for dent protection and uh, softer woods that are porous. When you get it in there, it makes the surface harder to dent. Um, obviously with wood, it's not gonna be perfect. You can always dent it, but any little bit of extra help you can get is useful to keep it looking good over its lifetime. Okay, now the whole thing has got its first coat on. You can see there's a few spots that are a little thicker than others, but it's starting to dry here pretty good. And I'll actually be able to sand this probably in an hour or two. Um, the first coat is the one that takes the longest to dry generally. Um, but again, here it's about 70 degrees and probably 25% humidity, 20%, something like that. It's pretty dry in Arizona, so this stuff dries really fast. Um, and that's part of the reason why I like it. So um, this, you can kind of see it's still a little bit shiny in here. The uh, satin finish goes on pretty shiny, but as it dries, it, uh, it loses its sheen, and it's going to kind of look a little more like this. It'll have just kind of a... A warm luster but not really reflective and I don't personally that's what I like um, one thing I want to note about cleanup is um, you saw I didn't wear gloves um, I use mineral spirits to clean my hands um, from everything I've read that's not really dangerous uh, for absorption into your skin um, don't put any water on first you uh, put a couple squirts of mineral spirits on your hand, wipe it, it'll dissolve the polyurethane, uh, and then you can use soap and water after that and cleans up really well. Uh, if you don't like that sticky stuff, you know, under your fingernails and stuff, some people don't, um, you can wear gloves like nitrile gloves or something um, and just take them off and throw them away. However, you can't use the really cheap, super thin ones because almost every finish I've tried will dissolve those and you'll just have a big mucky mess. Um, you have to use get some pretty high quality thick ones uh, like the ones that mechanics use um, to keep grease off of their hands. And one other thing I want to note is clean up with the rag. You can see I've, I've got my rag sitting here after I'm done with it, letting it dry on the edge all spread out because if you throw these in the bottom of your can in a tight wad, especially if it gets down or gets some sawdust buried over it, some kinds of finishes can spontaneously combust, most notably linseed oil. Um, sometimes I'll use a coat or two or linseed oil before I put that polyurethane on to give it a little more amber, uh, deeper look, especially on walnut or mahogany, something like that. Uh, Linseed oil is notorious for burning houses down because of this, and I've actually started fires in, my, in this very garbage can about 30 years ago. So I just get into the habit of stretching them out over the lip of my garbage can like this, let them dry, and when they're all hard, then you can throw them away like that, and it's safe. So that's it. We're going to wait for it to dry, and we'll come back and do some sanding in the second coat. So the mantle's gotten a full night to dry from this first coat. Um, so I did put it on very heavy, so I like to, the first coat will take a little longer to dry than the next coats will, just because there's a lot more and it's soaked into the wood. So I'm going to start with the carving part. Now this would be almost impossible to sand with just sandpaper. So again, just like when I buffed these uh, carvings after the cutting itself, 
I'm going to use these nylon um, abrasive wheels, but I'm going to use a little higher uh, grit. So the set I have goes from about 80 to I think 600. This is a 320 grit wheel. Um, and what I'm trying to do is just get the, there's little, you know, little pieces of raised grain and little, you know, pieces of dust and stuff. And so this, very, this first coat is a little bit rough to the touch. Even though I sanded this to 400 grit, the first coat of finish especially really brings out the dirt and the grain in the wood. So it's a little bit rough. So all we want to do is make this smooth to the touch. We don't want to take any more finish off of this than we have to because we're trying to we're trying to get this nice and smooth so there's no little particles that, that you can feel. So all I'm doing is sanding this well enough to make it feel smooth. So again, just like before, I'm going to work it in different directions to get in these cracks from different angles uh, so, so it all gets uh, sanded. Be careful when you're going across the grain that you're not using a, a coarse enough grit that it actually puts visible scratches in it um, and I can tell this one's doing that so I'm only I'm going to just continue to use this first for the pass that's with the grain because the scratches aren't really visible there and I'm going to push too hard but I'm going to switch to a higher uh, grit number a finer grit um, to do any of the cross grain afterwards. The other thing I like is these uh, little uh, abrasive sanding pads uh, for, for contoured surfaces like this where they're, they're kind of rough. Uh, for good flat surfaces like this, sandpaper is the best. But, uh, so I've now used the wheel and gotten into all the cracks and now I'm just kind of going over it a little bit to buff off any of the surfaces and if, if there's any little like dust, drops or dust particles that finish way down in the bottoms, I can get the corners of this in there and kind of polish it. So this makes a nice final pass. Um, again, I use these on a lot of uneven surfaces where sandpaper, because it's kind of stiff, tends to just sand off the top edges and does nothing down in, in the interior. Uh, these work a little bit better. Okay, I have a carving section all sanded now. Smooth to touch. I don't feel any little bumps or anything. Um, I've gotten all the sanding scratches removed and made sure if there are any, they're going with the grain. So now, now I'm going to start sanding the flat surfaces, and I uh, I do that always just hand sanding. It's uh, with the machine. It's just too easy to cut through the finish and get back into raw wood, and then you're starting over. So first, I have. Um, Use good quality sandpaper for all your sandpaper. Don't don't buy like the cheapest stuff you can find based on price because the, the good stuff has, especially with like 400 or 600 grit, you want very consistent grains on this. If you have even just a couple of small grains that are larger than the rest, you're gonna end up with pronounced scratching in your surface. So a good quality, this this happens to be Merca, but there's, there's many good brands out there, industrial quality. Um, that, uh, that work well. Um, I've tried the sterate sealed ones that supposedly have, you know, they have a coating that's supposed to have the sand uh, and dust not stick to it. I don't know, I don't see much uh, difference either way. Um, so um, I've kind of gone back to just the standard uh, stuff without the coating. But here's a tip on how to get the most out of your sanding sheet for hand sanding. Um, 
a lot of people just grab this or fold it in half and try and sand and, and what you end up doing is not using very much of the sandpaper and you don't have a piece that you could hang on to and get into different shapes very well. So what I found is I always fold a sheet in half first <clears throat> and you can just fold it a couple of times like that. Now it tears very easily into two. And then I take it and fold it back to back so the sandpaper's on the outside, like that. So now I have two quarter sheets and fold one of these inside and then fold the other one over it. Now I've got a piece that fits really well in my hand. <clears throat> It's got sanding edges, so I can sand in cracks with this when I want to. It's got sand on both sides, so when I'm sanding like this, the top is not slippery, it sticks to my skin, so I can easily sand. You can see I can do this without having to grip the sides. I can get right up into these edges here like this, because I have sandpaper right up the edge, I have a nice straight edge. Now I can flip it over and use this side up, and when both sides are used up, I just flip it around, and now I have two fresh sides. Some people want to do this and put the two pieces in like that. That's not what you want to do because now you have sandpaper rubbing against sandpaper and that just wears out the inside two pieces while you're using the outside two and it tends to come apart. So fold it over, kind of wrap it around. And then as I said, when these two become dirty and unusable, flip it around the other way. And then when all, all four sides are dirty, throw it away. And that's the other thing is people tend to try to use it too long. When you're sanding finish, you'll start to see little, little dots on the sandpaper building up and that's the finish kind of melting in and making uh, a, a glob of polyurethane or whatever kind of finish it is. When it gets full of those, it's not really usable. You're just rubbing finish on dried finish on dried finish. So um, I'll show a little later what it looks like when it's kind of done. but. Um, so, I've got my sandpaper now, and I'm going with the grain as usual, and I'm just sanding it enough to get all those rough spots off. Now, yes, it looks dull now, um, and that's exactly what I want. Um, we're trying to get the top smooth, so I just go along um, and sand it, and it's, it's going to be white like this, and then... When I'm all done, I'm going to take a rag and wipe that up. That takes, that gets the sawdust out of the grains pretty well. And then I'll blow it off with my air, air nozzle on the air compressor too. Um, and this is ready for another, co another coat. Now, you want to get that kind of whitish look. And, and, I, and then when you clean it off, you can see maybe there's some areas you missed. Um, what a nice, even surface and, and make sure there aren't any little uh, bubbles or or finish uh, <clears throat> spots. You want to see just a nice smooth finish here, nice dull finish. Now you got to be careful on edges like this. This is a slightly rounded over uh, corner here. Um, one thing is Never use really sharp corners on any woodworking stuff. Uh, it does, the finish doesn't stick to that corner very well. It dents super easy. Um, it's very hard to sand without taking the finish off when you do every single coat. So at a minimum, do at least like a 16th or an eighth inch round over at a very minimum. Um, and that it makes all of those problems significantly less worse. Here comes the garbage man. So you have to be careful on these corners when you're sanding. To You want to sand them, but you don't want to wear through the finish completely. And it's, and it's very easy. If you just push on this like this, that's what would happen. Or if you just try to sand it like this, your fingers would naturally bend around the edge and wear into that. So what I like to do is put my thumb or, some, or finger right in the middle there because that small pad of my thumb is just the right size and then use the rest to guide it. And if I go up and down on this, like that, I get a very controlled, flat, 
wiping of that, and now I have a very smooth surface there that did not gouge in or dig into these edges. So now I just have to do the edges. And what I'll do there, the other nice thing about these pads is, like I said, you've got two corners that you can get into edges, but you can also shape these very well because now there's four layers of sandpaper. So you can shape it this way to do an outside curve. And if you've got inside concave contours, you can shape these into very small radiuses or nice big large ones. So this allows you to do sanding in a lot of different ways. So for this one, I'm going to bend it down like this, and I'm just going to very lightly, I just want to, again, just get it enough to take off those edges, but I'm not pushing very hard, and I'm being very careful not to gouge through the, or dig through the surface here. So now i got to, and I, I always use my hands just to keep feeling it, see if there's any little bumps that need to come off, but if it, if it feels smooth, to the touch and it has a dull look to it, you're done and it's ready to sand and it's ready to uh, finish again for the second coat. So now it's all sanded, you can, it's very smooth, there's no dust on it. I, I Typically I'll blow it off the air compressor to get most of the stuff out of the cracks and, and things and then I'll wipe it off because that really cleans it up well and if I don't blow it off first then the rag gets so full of dust that it tends to leave dust behind a, a lot so I'll blow it off first then use a just a soft cloth to wipe it and then I'll blow it one more time just to kind of get any residual um, that that gets it pretty clean now it's ready for the second coat um, so you can see it's it's dull but every time we go through this uh, finish sand finish sand it's gonna get a little bit smoother it's gonna get a little deep, deeper look to it um, and like I said, typically I'm gonna do two wipe on coats and probably two spray on coats. So um, it's time to put on the second coat. Uh, you notice this time, I forgot to put it down the first coat, but I usually put some of this uh, recycled uh, covering paper. It, you can buy this, it's in the paint section at a home center. It's pretty cheap and I reuse it a lot. I'll roll this up afterwards because until it gets torn or something, you can keep reusing it, but it makes a great um, surface to put under a project so I don't have to scrape all the dried finish off my table saw later or my benches. Um, now another tip for when you're using a rag to wipe on a finish is I just take an old t-shirt and I don't use like bright colors because sometimes those will bleed through and the lint really shows up in the finish like if you have a bright red t-shirt and you get a couple pieces of that bright red lint on something like, you know, really light colored maple and it gets stuck in a crack or something, you'll notice that and you'll have to dig it out. Whereas um, something like a, a gray or a white um, isn't gonna, isn't quite as visible usually, but the, the bigger problem with it is, or the bigger advantage of it is, it doesn't have a lot of really bright, uh, dyes in it that can wash out into the finish. I've actually had uh, with some finishes some of that dye come out into the light colored woods and you'd actually see that. Um, but one tip for this is after you cut it I just use a scissors and cut off a hunk that I feel like is big enough and I'll kind of get all the lint pieces off just to minimize how much is going to be stuck there. I, I could sand it off later anyway but it's just nice to kind of get rid of most of that. And then I'm going <clears> to <throat> fold it up because I don't I don't, I want it to be kind of in the shape of a nice pad that I can do a nice flat wipe with it. And I don't really want the edges there. I want to sort of keep this as a, more like a paintbrush. So I'll fold it over and stuff. So I have basically a folded part here that I can use to wipe. And sometimes that's a little bit big. Um, I actually like that to be a little bit smaller like this. And so now this I can use, I can really soak this in and I can pad it in there but I can also do some nice flat wipes with this. Okay, I have sanded my second coat now and uh, hopefully you can see it's kind of a dull uh, look again. So when sanding it takes the sheen off, which is what you want, but it's very smooth. Um, so. 
I think two coats of rub on on this piece is going to be enough, and I'm going to go to spraying. So a um, couple things to note with spraying. Um, I have opened up one of my garage doors. Depending on the conditions, a lot of times I'll open up both of them. And I have a large 30-inch fan on my wall blowing uh, across this. I'm not trying. I, I have it running really slow. I have an actual speed controller on this one. Um, just trying to blow the fumes out the door. So uh, if you don't do this, you really need an open space or you need to uh, wear a mask or something. This can generate a lot of uh, uh, um, overspray. And it tends to float around a lot. You can see I've backed my vehicles out of the garage because it will actually drift over there and make kind of a, a dusty uh, coating on the on the paint and stick to it. And it, it can be buffed out, but it, it's kind of annoying and messes up your paint job and makes your windshields really rough when your windshield wipers run. So uh, I've left this one door open just uh, or closed because I didn't want the sunshine coming in here messing up the video. But normally I would open this up, like I said, and really let the ventilate the fumes out of here. But I don't want to run. If it's if it's really windy, um, I'll close things up uh, and and keep the, the wind down because I don't want a lot of dust blowing into the spray the final spray coats. I'm trying to keep these pretty smooth. I don't really care too much when I'm doing the wipe on because I know I'm going to be sanding multiple times after that. So we're ready to go. One thing I wanted to show. So again, I'm using the Minwax. Uh, polyurethane spray, uh, clear satin, so this is the the lowest of the sheens. Um, one thing to note on these, these are pretty high uh, quality nozzle and this little red tip is rotatable so when the the little line there is in the horizontal position that's actually going to make a vertical spray line pattern so this is not like spray paint that you buy at the hardware store where it makes a round spray pattern. This makes a nice uh, vertical uh, line. Hopefully you'll be able to see it in the video. I don't know if you will be. Um, and if you are, and that's the one I use most of the time, but if you're spraying something that's tall, vertical, and you want that pattern to be horizontal, you can take your finger and simply twist this 90 degrees so that these two lines are vertical, and that will make the uh, spray line horizontal. So it's always, this, the actual spray line is is the exact opposite of uh, what this little plastic line in that red piece are. Um, they come by default, they come with a vertical spray pattern. Um, but these these spray very well. Uh, much better quality uh, spray pattern than a normal spray paint. Um, the other thing to note is that to put on a good coat, you really need to be able to see very well how you're applying it. So what I always try to do, if possible, is try to get the uh, a light source on the other side of what I'm spraying so that I can see the reflection because the reflection is the best way to to see this. So if I'm spraying this surface, I'm going to kind of move around like this and as I'm spraying and look for a way to use the light from the window or maybe the garage to get a good reflection on this so I can see how much I'm laying down because without the reflection, it's hard to tell um, just how much you're putting down. And what I do generally is put down two spray passes for each location. So I'll go past it to the right and then back to the left. And and you, you'll be able to see when I do it kind of how close I am and what speed I am. You, you know, you kind of get a feel for it. Um, that puts down a, a pretty heavy coat, but it's not so much that it won't run on a vertical surface. So you're always, you know, trying to lay down a nice even coat but not get a bunch of runs and if you get runs and stuff don't worry about it just let it dry you can always sand it back down that's the nice thing about this finish is you can always repair it later um, if you mess it up you can get a lot of runs and drips and make it look really ugly and just let it dry you can s scrape it sand it later and come back and put another coat on if it gets messed up um, so I'm gonna I'm going to start spraying this now and just kind of give you a feel for what it looks like from a from a closeness and a speed perspective. Um, hopefully this is helpful. So as with all spray paints um, or spray finishes, you need to shake it up very good. I always shake it for a minute or so. The other thing is these have the balls in them. 
And if you wrote, if you have material that's not uh, mixed in yet, if you can tell that by if the ball rolls eat smoothly around the bottom, you can tell this one had the smooth roll. It's not bouncing and clanking around. If it can roll smoothly around that seam without bouncing, except you've probably got all the material in the bottom cleaned off uh, pretty well and it's okay to use. So um, I'm going to go ahead and spray now this one pretty good. I go back and forth up to a certain spot and I let off on the nozzle at each end. You don't want to start uh, and stop with it spraying, uh, otherwise you'll end up with kind of a pile of, paint, of spray right at the end. So as you're moving, you let up on it and then when you're moving back, you start again. So you're always in motion while you're starting and stopping the spray. These, are, these cans are also pretty good about not splattering when you start and stop, um, but every once in a while you'll get a bad nozzle on one of these. I mean, I've gone through hundreds of these cans over the years, and there's always a certain percentage of them that just have a bad nozzle on them. Um, so after you've <laughs> used a few of these, you'll know what a good one and a bad one are. And uh, if I get one that's splattery, I'll usually just pull the tip off from another can and, and put it on and use it. And if that doesn't solve the problem, then it's down inside, and, and a lot of times I'll just save it for some back of a project where I don't need good quality spray or something, but I won't use it for a finish coat because if it's splattering droplets instead of a fine spray, you just can't get a good finish. spots. Um, this is satin. When it dries, it's going to have a dry looking surface, not shiny. But when it's wet, it's very shiny. So that's why you use that, that gloss when it's wet to see where you've applied enough and where, and where you don't have enough. see what the fan is doing a good job of moving these fumes out I can't really smell or taste much of it I can see it in the sunlight drifting away pretty rapidly so this is a, a nice safe way to do this without <clears throat> creating a lot of dust and without having to wear a mask which I hate doing so I always use that fan to keep this clear
also periodically keep shaking as you're using it. The other thing I've noticed is that <clears throat> rotating the nozzle a quarter inch or so every once in a while as you're using it tends to keep the spray working better. I don't know why. Um, I haven't ever cut one of these open to see why that might be, but if the nozzle is in one place and starts to act kind of funny, it's not spraying very well, most of the time just simply rotating a little bit um, will we'll fix that. And again, I, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I've done this for a long time using these and it, it always just works. That's it. You can see it's a pretty quick job to just spray it. That's a, the other, one of the other reasons why I like spraying versus wiping on. Get a very high quality finish real quickly. And the last thing to note is when you get done with these, tip it upside down and spray it for a few seconds. You can see after a second or two, there's no more spray coming out. It's all clear. Now the nozzle is clean and it will work fine the next time to take it out. This can sit for months now and still be clear uh, there's nothing to dry in that nozzle and ruin it so always clean your nozzle out when you're done like that okay first spray coat is dry uh, it's been sitting here about seven or eight hours it's it's dry enough to sand now I could actually quit here it's it's very smooth very even uh, but I just I want one more coat on just a little bit more to be protective you can see it's it's got a nice semi-gloss sheen to it uh, but I want to put a little bit more on so, so I'm going to sand it and put the second spray coat on um, and what I'm going to do here is spray it so that the uh, surfaces that I'm spraying are horizontal um, that way I can put it on just a little bit thicker and see it a little bit better than the way I did the first coat where the the top and the bottom were actually sitting vertical on the sideways. Uh, it's a little easier to spray this way when they're flat like this, so you'll see that I position it, reposition the work piece a little bit each time I do uh, the top and the front and the bottom.
maybe you saw me in the middle of spring when I when I tried this new can. As soon as I tried it, this was a good example of, of one of those tips that just didn't perform very well. So uh, they have like a little metal push rod that comes down from the top, and the, the valve is down inside this plastic piece. So it's a little bit different than your typical spray paint. Um, like I said, it's to give you a better quality spray. However, this one just didn't spray right. It was it was uh, making a, a kind of a weird, heavy, splattery spray, not a nice, even one. So uh, I tried reseeding it at a couple different angles, and it just wouldn't get better. Um, so in my experience, when they're like that, it's, it's in the tip itself. So I took the one from the old can, which I was going to throw away anyway, and I swapped it out, and it sprayed just fine again. So... Um, that's something I always to keep in mind, especially if on a bigger project. Uh, in this case, like I use three cans on here, so it's not really a big deal to I keep the old one or pull it out of the garbage and, and swap out the tips if needed to get a good spray. So um, this one should be the final coat, and we're going to let it dry for a day, and we're going to go install it tomorrow. I added this clip to show uh, that things don't always go as planned and, and add a little humor to the video. So uh, as you can see, this is a small clip of the first part of the attempt at the install um, where it was fitting too tight, uh, even though it had a really nice template of the, of the shape of the wall. Um, it was my fault. I, I didn't measure the 2x4 that was already bolted to the fireplace uh, that was the piece that we were screwing to it, it turns out its thickness or actually the width of the two by four the three and a half inch um, dimension was significantly different all the way across so the little piece of cross-section sample that I got from my friend um, did fit very well where he had it mounted um, and I actually made the mantle a little bit bigger than that even kind of thinking that some areas would be a little tighter but it turned out that some of the Two, or sec two by four sections were significantly bigger um, and the uh, sheetrock guys didn't do a very good job of uh, putting the sheetrock in straight um, on that area either above and below the two by four so we ended up just tearing out the sheetrock there and ripping off the old construction dimensioned uh, two by four and then I got a new set of two by fours and actually milled it down it in the shop to the proper dimensions uh, and screwed those on and then it fit like a glove uh, I don't have any video of that because it was kind of boring but uh, our wives got a little bit of entertainment watching us trying to uh, squeeze that thing onto that 2x4 and it just wasn't going to go so um, don't try to put a the lesson is don't try to put a precision piece of furniture on a old crappy piece of construction lumber make them both fit each other before you try to mount it. <laughs> so after we got the 2x4 dimension properly, uh, this fit very well. Uh, so the template worked great uh, once, we, once it would slide over the 2x4. And then um, what holds it on is it's just got about eight screws on the top edge right next to the stone. Um, that go down into the 2x4 and it's, it's very solid and then uh, they'll put a little bit of um, caulk based grout um, you can buy a sanded grout that's in a caulk tube um, and they'll shoot that in above and below between the stone and the walnut to kind of finish it off and uh, it's going to look like it's built right in This is a close-up view of the carving. Um, I think it turned out pretty good. Um, this is a. It's kind of nice that the customer was able to go on the website, design and make, and pick out the scene they liked, and then I just purchased it and downloaded it and carved it on the CNC. And that is the end. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, please give me some feedback. Or if you have any questions, uh, ask questions in the comments sections. I will get back to you. And let me know if there's anything else um, that I could do in the future or could have done better in this. Uh, appreciate any of that, the feedback I could get. And like I said, I hope you enjoy it. Subscribe if you uh, got something out of this, please. It helps me out as well. Thank you.